Hello and welcome everybody to my presentation here at EPSC. My name is Bjorn Conrad. I'm a master's student at ETH Zurich and today I will be presenting results I found in my master's thesis in which I studied the atmospheric retrieval sensitivity um, for Earth twin exoplanets um, observed with the LIFE telescope. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction into what a retrieval does. So we start with some sort of an input spectrum, which in our case is um, the thermal emission spectrum of an Earth to an exoplanet. And you already see there are many absorption features from different molecules here. The goal of a retrieval study is to find information on the atmospheric structure and composition from this input spectrum. So basically we ask ourselves, given this input spectrum, what is the mass, the radius, the surface temperature? What is the atmospheric pressure temperature structure um, corresponding to this input spectrum? And what are the abundances of the different molecules? And what do we need for such a retrieval framework? First of all, we need an input spectrum. And in my thesis, I used a 1D radiative transfer tool called Petit Rattrans. I considered absorption and emission from several different molecules listed here. However, I neglected Rayleigh scattering, surface scattering, and clouds. Now, just a short motivation for this neglecting. Here, I plot um, the contribution from expected from different um, sources for the wavelength range of interest. In green, I give Rayleigh scattering, in red, surface scattering, and in blue, I give cloud scattering. And here, this orange line marks the most optimistic noise source I use in my studies. So all other noise sources will be higher than this. And we see that surface scattering and Rayleigh scattering lie well below this noise so it is okay to neglect them. However, cloud scattering lies above this noise, which means that it is a strong simplification neglecting it. However, we need to neglect it because considering cloud scattering would significantly slow down the code, which would make the studies I will present later unfeasible. Additionally, we also knew, need a method of estimating the noise in observation with life. And for this, we use the LIFE SIM tool, which is also um, the work of another master student here at ETH, uh, Maurice Altiger. We The LIFE SIM tool considers um, contributions to observational noise from local zodiacal dust, exozodiacal dust, as well as stellar leakage. And finally, we need a retrieval framework. Our retrieval framework is based on the nested sampling Bayesian parameter estimation scheme and uses the 1D radiative transfer model Petit-Rattrans. And with this framework, we hope to get first estimates for the technical requirements for atmospheric characterization with the LIFE telescope. How do we do this? We run our retrievals on a grid of several different input spectra for an Earth twin exoplanet located at 10 parsecs from Earth. Why an Earth twin? We argue that if we want to be able to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets, we should at least be able to characterize an Earth twin. So this is a good starting point. Additionally, we consider different baseline optimization. So basically, um, the noise of the LIFE telescope optimized for short wavelengths or 50 microns, as well as different exosodiacal dust contributions of three exosodes and 0.5 exosodes. Further, we consider different signal to noise ratios, all at 11 microns and spectral resolutions, as well as wavelength ranges. This leads to a total of 96 cases, which is too much to discuss in this short time. So we will mainly focus on the R equals 50 and R equals 35 cases, as well as on SNRs greater than 10. First, we consider the performance of the retrieval for planetary parameters. Here we present the results. The black lines indicate the true values. The shaded areas give some reference range. And the dots of different shapes and colors basically give the retrieved values and uncertainties. 
we see that the mass isn't really constrained by our retrieval, which is in correspondence with other retrieval studies. However, the radius, surface pressure, and surface temperature of the planet are very nicely retrieved for all considered wavelength ranges and spectral resolutions, as well as signal to noise ratios. So no constraints here. Now we go on to the atmospheric species. Um, first, we see that the atmospheric bulk constituents, oxygen and nitrogen, are not retrieved, even though we consider features from collision-induced absorption. The atmospheric trace gases, the results we find are summarized here. The C, U, L, U, S, L just um, stand for the different types of um, posterior distributions, so basically from unconstrained posterior all the way to a constrained Gaussian posterior, which would be C. We find that CO2, O3, and H2O are nicely retrieved for all wavelength ranges R and S and R. Similarly, CO and N2O are not retrievable for any of the considered R and S and R. Now, the interesting stuff happens for methane because here we have a strong dependence on R and S and R, as you can see here. So we will now, from now on, focus, focus just on methane. First of all, we consider the wavelength range dependence of methane. We see that um, we have a better performance for the short wavelength optimized noise. We see some statistical fluctuations which are not really um, of importance. But generally, we observe that for the 6 to 17 micrometer wavelength range, we have a reduced performance of the retrievals for both cases. This suggests that the preferred wavelength range for life would be larger than um, 4 to 18.5 microns at least. Now we will focus on the R and S and R requirements and we find that we need at least an R of 50 combined with an S and R of 10 or an R of 35 combined with an S and R of 15 to retrieve, um, to get a good estimate for the methane abundance. And this is for the short wavelength optimized case. If we go to um, the long wavelength optimized case, we basically even need better performance. Now we can also consider the estimates for the required observation times we get from the Lifeson tool. And again, we see, first of all, we consider three different live telescopes. So four times one meter, four times two meters, and four times 3.5 meter primary mirror sizes. And we see that the four times one meter case isn't feasible because we have observation times of 700 days in a characterization phase of about three years, which doesn't, which isn't feasible. The other two cases are feasible. And we also observed that the R is equal to 50 case requires less observation time to achieve similar results. Thus, we would prefer an R equals 50. Furthermore, more advanced studies showed, we will publish these studies, that R equals 35 is unlikely to be um, high enough for a robust CH4 detection, which really, again, underlines that we need a spectral resolution of 50. Now, for the end, just a brief comparison between reflected light and emission studies. The reflected light studies performed by Fenedal are very similar to the study I presented here, and we just compare them briefly. So we see that thermal emission studies have the potential of um, detecting the, the important gases, CO2 and methane, which are not accessible in the optical range. Furthermore, um, emission studies also pose stronger constraints on the radius and surface pressure, and additionally, can find uh, the surface temperature. In contrast, reflected light studies have the potential of detecting the other important gas, oxygen. So this really shows that um, in addition to the reflected light approaches, LUVAR and HABREX proposed by NASA, we should also focus on a thermal emission study because the combination of these two results could really augment our um, exoplanet research. So life would be a great option. Um, for, in the end, just a brief summary and outlook. So the minimal requirements for the life interferometer 
are mirror sizes of at least four times two meters. Even better would be 3.5 meters. We also find that we need a, at least a wavelength range of 4 to 18.5 micrometers, a spectral resolution of at least 50, and a signal to noise ratio of at least 10. Now, just a brief outlook for future work. In the first step, we will try to run retrievals for more complex input spectra from 3D atmospheric models, which, com uh, which consider um, more atmospheric physics like atmospheric circularization, clouds, and all that stuff to just get more accurate results or estimates. And then few, in the further future, we would like to go beyond Earth twin. So what happens if the planet is located farther or closer to the sun? What happens if the radius is smaller or larger? What happens with other atmospheric composition and so on? The problem at the moment is that this requires a large computational, um, a large amount of computational time, which is currently not feasible with our code. So we will have to find new approaches. So this is the end of my presentation. Thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, please contact me. I'm happy to answer them and have a nice week and also a nice rest of the con conference. Thank you.